morning and welcome to Portage Avenue Church. If you're in the foyer, please make your way inside. We're here and today, I was saying this to somebody here, uh, you're getting a lot of Pastor Jedediah, so don't worry, our opening will be long-winded, our sermon will be long-winded, our closing will be long-winded, hallelujah! All right, that's what we have today because Pastor Jennifer, and we forgot to put this in the bulletin, is on vacation. And she is traveling in Europe right now with her family, with her, with her parents. And so we wanted to bless her so you can see the date she's gone. And uh, I also wanted to make mention there were a few things in the bulletin as I see people making their way in. I'm just going to talk about it now. Just a few corrections that need to be made. So if you have your bulletin today and you look at that, I want you to look. There is going to be, uh, it shows in the bulletin, somebody that's in the hospital that is no longer in the hospital. And that is, and praise the Lord, right? But Esther Braun is no longer at St. Boniface. Yeah, we can, praise the Lord. We prayed that she'd get out. And so cross her name off. She is not at St. Boniface. She is at home. Also, I noticed that our summer picnics, we have the wrong date. In that, it says June 18th. It was brought to my attention that that is not a Sunday. It is June 16th. June 16th. So if you're a bulletin person, get it out, cross the 18th out, put 16th in. We will make the correction. As I'm doing it here publicly, the people that do the bulletin are listening and it will get corrected. I promise you that. All right. So with all of that said, I just want to describe to you who we are. We are a church of many different nations that serves one Lord and Savior. And on a Sunday morning, we come together from all different walks of life, from all different parts of the city from different ethnicities and we come to worship the one the king of kings and the lord of lords and that is jesus christ that is our agenda that is what we are about as a church to honor and worship the king of kings and the lord of lords and that's what we're going to do today so if you're visiting and you're saying i wonder what this church is all about I just described it to you. If you're on the live stream and you wonder, I wonder what this church is about. I'm viewing it online. You're hearing it now directly. We are a church that seeks to honor and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to do it in singing. We're going to do it in our worship, our posture. We're going to do it in the way we share God's word. We're going to honor God's word as the best that we are able to. We are going to go through God's word. That's why we go through God's word verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And we are also going to always, always as a church offer Jesus because we believe Jesus is the answer to all the problems that are going on in this world. We truly believe it. We truly believe all the warfare, all the killing, all the violence, all the corruption, all the perversion, we believe Jesus is the answer. And that's why we're here today, to honor him and ask for him to reign in this place, in our city, and around the world. Amen? Amen. Let us pray and lift up our praise to the living God. Let's go before him. Lord Jesus, we come before you today and we thank you. We thank you that we have this opportunity to come together as your people and worship you. This is not just Portage Avenue coming together and worshiping. We have churches from around the world that come together as your people and worship you. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that we would honor you and everything that we do here in this space, in this time together. I ask, Lord Jesus, if there is anything that is not of you that is coming into this place. We know how the enemy wants to infiltrate your, your, your territory, and we want to cast out the enemy in the name of Jesus. We want your sweet presence here, and so we ask for your Holy Spirit to be here, working within us, around us, within our midst, guiding us. Lord Jesus, we want to give you all the praise and our focus and our attention be upon you. May you lead us today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Can God's people please say? Amen. Amen. Let's worship the King of Kings. Amen. We invite you to stand. We want to sing and invite the Lord, the Lord to be present as we worship this morning in our hearts as we sing. Come, O fount. Come, O fount of every blessing to my arms to sing your praise. Streams of Never cease Call for songs of the loudest praise Teach me some melodious song Some by flaming tongues of God Praise the mountain Fix upon it Mount of 
wish to come, knowing the battles won. For you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faith. This is my comfort.
and Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, you will give life to moral bodies by this same Spirit living within you.
So I want to make sure I, I don't work behind the scenes in a lot of these areas. So I just want to make sure it's very clear. Um, live stream, make sure that the cameras are on me. And it's not because it's about me, but because of what I'm about to share with the church. And I don't want it panned out to the audience at all. Uh, the reason I'm saying that right now is because we have a, a missionary couple that most of you don't even know are a missionary couple here in the church. They have made this church their home as they have been on furlough for the last five to six months. And I have been so blessed to get to know them. They're the kind of missionaries I would like to serve with. They have come here and only blessed this pastor. They haven't asked anything. They've just been here to pray and to serve and to be here a part of this church. And they chose this church because we are international. And they're having to do some international studies and learn some languages. I'm not going to say where it is and what they're doing, but because of uh, restrictions, I can't bring them up to the pulpit because of our messaging going out on the live stream. I am able to use their pseudo name, Andrew and Annette, and they are going to be prayed for right now as they are going back onto the mission field. I want you to know, and this is the mission field too, but where they are going, there is going to be some variables that make it at times difficult to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know if you're on the live stream and you're wondering, I wonder who this is. Come to the church. We have a bunch of outlaws for Jesus Christ here that's, that make this church their home. We are about going out to the nations. Whether they are okay with us proclaiming the gospel or not, we're going out there. We're going around the world to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the answer. And I want to wish we could sing that Andre Crouch song, but we will one day. I love that old song. Okay, so for our time now, could we just extend our hands out and it's going to go out to to Andrew and Annette, and if you're near them and you know about their story, then please lay your hands on them and let's pray for this couple. Lord Jesus, we come before you today and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you have put on the hearts of men and women and this couple in particular that is willing to serve wherever you lead them. And I just ask, Lord Jesus, that you would empower them that you would speak to them and guide them as they are working through various circumstances, various cultures, uh, Lord, that are fallen, various ideology that is strictly just not of you. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would give them inroads and favor with the people that they are serving so that they can share your good news to them. Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would give them all that they need, that you would equip them, prepare them, speak to them, and give them the words even that they need to say at the right moment, at the right time. Lord Jesus, would you go with them? In Jesus' name, the name above every name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, church family. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, a few other items before the children are dismissed that I just would like to share with our church family. Uh, I just found out, and so I would ask of you, church family, to be praying for the Sudermans. Peter Suderman is in the hospital at Health Science Center. I just found that out, and so I would ask of you as a church family, let's lift up prayers for Peter, for healing, and for his family. I also want to make note that uh, we have a few items that we do need to address here. Uh, the uh, youth is this Thursday going to Assiniboine Park. And what that means, parents, and this is why I want to do this before the children are dismissed. Parents, I need you to register your child because we can't have people show up at Assiniboine and not have a ride home. That's not safe. And, and so we need you to register your children so that we know everybody has a ride home. We are going to meet this Thursday at Assiniboine Park, our normal time, seven o'clock. I sure hope you can make it. Lastly, 
I have one more item uh, coming next Saturday. It starts at 6.30. We typically have once a month a, uh, we call it a uh, newly or soon to be married group. That group has grown more and more and more and it's primarily young adults. So what we have decided to do for this coming Saturday is invite all the young adults, whether you're married or going to be married or not, we want you all to join us, and in the summer, we want to do activities together. Walter and Chris have been leading it, and we want to encourage all of you to show up. It starts at 6.30. We typically have a little bit of snack food that we encourage you to bring a little plate, and then at 7, we start our study and fellowship together. I think that is everything I needed to announce. Now, children, please stand up and make your way to the back. Uh, because your teachers are there, ready, and, I, and we are excited for what you are going to learn today. Uh, the beginning of this series, I never thought we would go as in-depth through Genesis as we have, and I'm thankful. It has challenged me, and now we're at a part in this particular text where we're going to talk about Jacob's redemption story. It's starting now, which is good because it was pretty heavy for quite a while as we looked at Jacob's life previous to this point. Jacob was a cheat. He was a manipulator. He was cowardly young man who hid behind his mother. That's the reality of what we read. There's no reason to dance around it. But something changed when Jacob had an encounter with the living God. See, it's one thing to have your mama support you or your daddy to support you or to have a Barnabas who is the son of encouragement supporting Paul. It's another thing when you have the living God that backs you. And we talked about that encounter that God identified Jacob and said, I know who you are, Jacob. Meaning, I know you're a cheat. I know you're a manipulator. I know you're a coward, but I am going to go with you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to bless you. And it was in that encounter that Jacob has this profound awe and wonder of God's mercy and grace upon his life. And you see right at the very beginning that he dedicates 10% of his earnings to the living God. He says, I'm dedicating this to you. And this is him starting to step into this role as the leader of God's people. Because long ago, we see that Abraham did the same thing. He gave 10% to Melchizedek, who is the high priest and, yes, high king of Salem, which is now currently Jerusalem. And so we now have this, 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 this Jacob that is going to go forward and with the support and the backing of the living God. And this is really important because God sees the past, the present, and the future, and he can see it all at once. It makes like almost no sense to us. He can be in multiple places at once. That makes no sense to us. He doesn't work within our law. I mean, he can work within our laws, but he can go beyond our laws, laws of even science. And this is quite profound because when Jesus and the living God speaks into your life, when Jesus says, I believe in you, I'm going to back you, I'm going to support you, and I'm going to bless you, that is quite significant because Jesus sees the future. And he knows the potential for your life if you submit your life to him. And so he, the living God sees Jacob's potential. He sees what he could become. And this is so important that we understand that God is omniscient, that he can see all of this. And so when he, when he speaks into Jacob's life, it's not just him giving some empty promise it's not just to make, you know, Jacob feel good. No, that is something that if you submit your life, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what you're going to be. Even though everything previously was not up to that. Even though previously you were a coward, I can make you strong. And so we're going to look at that today. And I've realized as I'm speaking to you that Many people allow other voices to speak into their lives. 
and I would even say Christians I have met with that have allowed uh, the enemy to speak into their lives. And I'll just say what it is. It's demonic messaging. And for whatever reason in their lives, they've allowed it to penetrate their life. It goes something like this. You are hopeless. You are a failure. There is no, God certainly couldn't forgive you for what you have done with X, Y, and Z. You're a loser, and let's just be honest about it. There's nothing you can do about it. How many of you have heard those voices? That is of the enemy. That is not Jesus Christ, it says to the Apostle Paul, says there is no condemnation or shame in Jesus Christ. See, Jesus will say something like this. He will say, he will, might say to you that I believe in you, but why are you doing this? Why are you hurting yourself? Come back to me. Even when God's people were at their very worst, when they were hurting each other and hurting other people, when they were at their very worst and God, through the prophets, said, look what's going to happen to you. He laid it out, but always within laying it out, he said, come back to me though. If you just come back to me, we will, I will heal the land. The God's people didn't because God can see the future. He knew they weren't going to do it. But you see it in God's word. He'll say, here's all the bad stuff that's happening to you because of your decisions, because of what you have done. All the evil, worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, is what is being committed within Jerusalem. But if you turn back to me, if you come back, I'll heal you. Just come back. That's the prophets. That's the messaging. That's what God says. He didn't say that you're hopeless. He says, no, there's hope. Just turn back to me. Come to me and I will heal you. I promise all, you will have a calling in your life. I see the potential in your life. Please don't keep hurting yourself. That's what God says. And there is a difference. And it shocks me how often we allow the enemy to speak. And the enemy always is going to speak a message of hopelessness. It's always going to be at the forefront because what it does is it discourages us, it defeats us, and then we go on with our life in some indifferent, apathetic way. Oh, there's nothing we can do about it. It is what it is. Oh, I'm struggling with whatever, pornography. Nothing I can do with it. It is what it is. Yeah, that's where the enemy wants you. Absolutely defeated. Oh, I have this drinking problem. There's nothing I can do about it. Just is what it is. Guess what? God can heal that and transform it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Stop compromising. Stop giving the enemy a foothold in your life. Stop being so complacent. There is victory in Christ Jesus. We sing that. And if you don't believe it, why are you here? Literally. Literally. All right, I sort of went off the strip a lot. I didn't follow it at all. I'm sorry, translators. So we're going to talk about what is changing in Jacob's life right away after he has that encounter with the living God. Let's read it in Genesis chapter 29, starting in verse 1. It says this, Then Jacob hurried on, finally arriving in the land of the east. He saw a well in the distance, Three flocks of sheep and goats lay in an open field beside it, waiting to be watered. But a heavy stone covered the mouth of the well. It was the custom there to wait for all the flocks to arrive before removing the stone and watering the animals. Afterward, the stone would be placed back over the mouth of the well. Jacob went over to the shepherds and asked, Where are you from, my friends? We are from Haran, they answered. Do you know a man there named Laban? the grandson of Nahor. He asked, yes, we do, they replied. Is he doing well, Jacob asked. Yes, he's well, they answered. Look, here comes his daughter Rachel with the flock now. Jacob said, look, it is still broad daylight, too early to round up the animals. Why don't you water the sheep and goats so they can get back out to pasture? We can't water the animals until all the flocks have arrived. They replied, then the shepherds moved the stone from the mouth of the well, and we water all the sheep and goats. Jacob was still talking with them when Rachel arrived with her father's flock, for she was a shepherd. 
And because Rachel was his cousin, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and because the sheep and goats belonged to his uncle Laban, Jacob went over to the well and moved the stone from its mouth and watered his uncle's flock. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and he wept aloud. He explained to Rachel that he was her cousin on her father's side, the son of her aunt, Rebekah. So Rachel quickly ran and told her father, Laban. As soon as Laban heard that his nephew Jacob had arrived, he ran out to meet him. He embraced him. He kissed him. He brought him home. When Jacob had told him his story, Laban explained, you really are my own flesh and blood. And Jacob had stayed with Laban for about a month. That is the reading of God's word. And we're going to just talk about this a little bit. Where we just left off with Laban's response. Let's be really honest about it. Laban is interested about his own household. He is very opportunistic. And we're going to learn more about Uncle Laban. We need to be very clear. The last time Laban ran out to greet a visitor in God's word was when? It was when Abraham's servant was going to find a wife for Isaac by the name of Rebekah. What did that servant bring when Laban ran out? Jewels, treasures, livestock, Now we have almost the identical scene. Laban's running out to kiss and greet his visitor from the the household of Abraham and Isaac. And what is he greeted with? A man that has been thrown out because of his deceptive, manipulative, and lying ways has been thrown out of the land and needs to come under the protection of his uncle Laban. You can imagine the disappointment of Laban, right? I think we all would have some disappointment. Well, previously I got jewels. Now I've just got this guy I've got to take care of under my household, really? Uncle Laban will make sure that he gets something out of this relationship. And we are going to look at that more in detail the following weeks. For now, I want to look particularly at Jacob. Because what happens when Jacob has this encounter with the living God, immediately after the vision or this dream, we can call it, he ties his earnings, he makes a financial commitment, but He does something even more than what we're talking about financially. We see in this story, he starts to walk differently, talk differently, act differently. And I hope today I can highlight that appropriately and clearly to you. Meaning after the experience at Bethel with the living God, he goes forward. And it says right away that he hurries in the... um, If the most literal interpretation of that, that word in the New Living Translation that says hurry, it actually should, or a way, a more accurate way of saying it is he picked up his feet, which is really strange to say in English. We don't use that expression. He picked up his feet. But it's more than just the man's in a hurry. What it means is that he went forward hurriedly and cheerfully, joyously, Because no longer is the future uncertain for Jacob. No longer is he wandering without a future in store. He now has the assurance of the living God that will go with him and protect him. And so he goes out wandering to the east joyously. Now let's look immediately how he approaches the next scene, the next part of this story. Previously in Jacob's life, let's just be honest about it. He was one mistake after another, one bad decision after another. Like we don't have really anything positive to say up to this point about Jacob. One bad mistake after another. And it cost him so much that he had to flee the land, his land, the land he knew and go out east. Now you see that he encounters three shepherds. This is the first encounter he's had with anyone else since he had this encounter with God. 
And he first asks, you know, inquires about his uncle, but it's the next part that is fascinating. We need to look at it carefully. He says, he, he, said, he says to the shepherds, it's broad daylight. Why are you waiting here? Move the well the, and get going so you can water and take care of your, shep, your, your sheep and goats and so that they can go out into the fields and graze. He seems he's come across some lazy shepherds. They're wasting away the day and going to wait for their customary reasons. They use it. They hide behind their tradition. Well, this is what we've always done. And so they just are laying there, sitting back, waiting for all the other shepherds to come. And Jacob sees in the distance Rachel coming with the flock, his uncle Laban's flock, so what does he decide to do? He takes matters into his own hands. Jacob opens the well, immediately starts watering his uncle's flock so that they can go out to posture, pasture. Excuse me. See, the first point I want to make and emphasize here is Jacob's apparent change. See, we're, what we see here is some boldness, a tenacity, and maybe even if I can say it, a little bit of an aggressive confrontation. He does not know these shepherds. The shepherds have told him, we have a tradition. This is how we do things around here. And in the ancient world, tradition was pretty important, by the way. This is how we do it. You're an outsider. Know your role. And Jacob sees his uncle Laban's flock coming. He says, uh-uh, I'm going to go and take the initiative and deal with that. Do you think he, that put him in good favor in that little community of shepherds? No, because it exposes the shepherds. By the way, there is no indication that Jacob had supernatural strength. This is not a Samson scenario. There is no indication that Jacob was, was given supernatural strength. There's no indication that this was a miraculous event. Rather, what does he do? He goes and moves the stone. He exposes the shepherds for what they were. See, what I'm getting at is Jacob's coming out of his shell. He begins to act and live and speak differently. Because prior, if we're going to be honest about it, prior, and this is my first point, Jacob was rather cowardly. That was his personality. He, he worked behind the scenes. He hid behind his mother. And now he's got this boldness, this courage to where he says, yeah, I get it. This is the tradition of the time. You're wasting, though. You're wasting valuable sunlight. And he goes and takes the initiative and removes it, the well stone, so that he can then water Laban's flock. He begins to assert himself and stand against the cultural norms of the day, which I know might sound odd to us. I mean, the cultural norms of the day was a distribution of water. I get it. There's not a lot of arguments about that. Maybe there is. Engineers, or do we have a lot of arguments about that? Maybe the engineer community does on how we distribute the water properly. I do know that living in a pseudo-desert in California, water was the, of the utmost importance, and there was a lot of debate on how you utilize it, how it was distributed, here we have a lot of water, and I'm very thankful for it. My backyard is getting annoying, though. We got to stop the water. I can't get rid of the ducks. I have a pool in my backyard. I need it so I can put the pool up. But that's another story. I'm thankful for all the moisture. Praise the Lord. So he, he, he takes the initiative, even in spite of potential risk or causing friction and even hostility with these local shepherds. And it's not just those three. Remember, there's other shepherds that are coming. They're going to come and say, who moved this without me? That's not what we've decided. And see, his agenda just seems to shift from what he can get out of everything and protecting himself to this courageous and bold servant of the living God. See, Jacob starts to become a man that God needs as a leader of his people. Now, point two, it needs to be addressed that Jacob's character previously, let's just call it for what it is. It was selfish. Jacob was about Jacob. Remember, he wouldn't even give his brother a bowl of stew without getting something out of it. 
right? That's the dynamic relationship with Jacob that we have. He got, him in, he got himself in so much trouble because Jacob thought of himself and benefiting himself. Now we see a Jacob who's willing to serve and selfless. He's going out to help his uncle Laban's flock. Now, I know right away some of you are going to say, oh, but Jedediah, there is this romantic component. That's what's driving him selfishly to help and serve because, you know, Jacob and Rachel have a thing. The text this early has no indication of that. I know some of you are going to say, but they kiss. No, no, no. That's family. And in the ancient world, that would have been, especially with the Hebrew people, would have been completely appropriate. It would not have been any indication of romance. You need to understand that. There is no romance at this point. What he is going to do is that's my uncle Laban's flock. I am going to go and help. And even put my own early reputation at risk because he just arrived and now he's not making some shepherds very happy. See, he starts in this moment to take the emphasis off himself and starts to focus his attention upon the living God and thus becomes a servant rather than someone that's preoccupied with his own agenda. His agenda shifts from himself to others because he now has a larger and, yes, a more fulfilling goal and purpose that God has spoken into his life. No longer is Jacob trying to strive to better himself, but he releases it all to the living God and allows God to lead him. And yes, as God leaves him, leads him, he starts to serve first and foremost. Lastly, this is my third point. I want to say that this about Jacob uh, and his transformation, the change in his life. Prior to experiencing this encounter with the living God, we see Jacob who was deceptive, he was manipulative, and he always worked behind the scenes. And you can imagine, by the way, how hard and how difficult that would be if you grew up in a family and you were always the second child. It, the text makes it really clear. The patriarch, Isaac, loved Esau, Jacob, he's, he's, he's a unique child we pray for. You know, he stays in the house. He doesn't hunt. He doesn't do the things that a, a man in the ancient world should be doing. He's a little different. Can you imagine living in that? Where the text makes it really clear that the patriarch favored Esau. He was always second. Always second. And so with that, you're constantly striving, constantly trying to find ways to be accepted and loved by the patriarch. But the true patriarch is the living God. And he has just spoken into Jacob's life. And because of that, what we see now of Jacob is he's willing and able to be himself and be vulnerable willing to weep out loud, show such emotion in public, even kisses Rachel. We see someone that is far less reserved than what we've been reading about previously. Someone who's willing to be vulnerable even in front of strangers. He's able to to show this emotion in such a fashion that it that it's almost uncomfortable for us to read. Like you're weeping in front of all these strangers, including Rachel. I mean, you just met her. What are you doing? But he's so overjoyed because do you realize in that moment when he finally sees and meets Rachel and Uncle Laban's flock, he realizes what this God has spoken into his life is now a reality. It's not an empty promise. When God said, I will go with you and I will protect you, he did it. I will direct you, he did it. He's now where he's supposed to be. How profound that was and it led led him to tears because of the awesomeness of God. And we see this so frequently that often in our lives when we're living in darkness and in, in hiding and being deceptive, that is, that's how the enemy gets, gets a hold of us and speaks lies into our lives. And Jesus came, we read about it in the, in the Gospel of John chapter one, that Jesus came to expose the light. 
And when we expose, I mean, excuse me, the darkness, he, Jesus came to expose the darkness. His light exposes the darkness. And so what, does, what happens is that then we, as it's exposed, we ask for healing and then we live freely and we can be more vulnerable and be more honest and be true to who we really are. Actually, what we learn about Jacob is that he's far more bold and courageous than we originally thought. Because with someone affirming him like the living God, he can be who God has created and asked him to be. Even though everything previously was completely the opposite. Even though he had his mother's affirmation, it wasn't enough. He needed the living God to affirm and to bless and to walk with him. See, Jacob truly experienced the living God and it changed him. And in that moment, when he is facing Rachel, he realizes, yes, he comes to the reality that God is going with him and going to protect him. He cries and cries. Remember, he's weeping, but he's weeping with joy. He no longer needs to try and position himself above others. He no longer needs to, st- he no longer needs to keep striving and trying to get ahead. He doesn't need to fight for position of honor to be accepted because God has already said, I accept you, I love you, I'm going to bless you. Do you see the difference? It's great. Jacob can now just be himself. He knows that now he is a valued child to the living God and thus he can be honest with his emotions, which by the way is not easy for some of us. There are many more trials that Jacob is going to face, but now he knows God honors his promises. See, a life transformed by this encounter with the living God brought change in Jacob's life. He no longer was cowardly, but bold and courageous. He no longer was so focused on himself, but rather was a servant and was willing to serve his uncle Laban. And by the way, he served his uncle Laban for years and years and years. And yes, he was even taken advantage of. Lastly, he was authentic and no longer hiding in in the darkness, but living in the light as God had created him to be. There were no longer heirs of pretentiousness, but rather someone who was vulnerable before others because he found his value in the living God. Now, the next part I want to speak to all of you about, uh, I don't want it to be taken the wrong way, but I certainly don't want to beat around the bush. And so I want to just say this, And I want to say it quite clearly, but I want to ask each one of you, have you had an encounter with the living God? It seems that Jacob sure needed it. When life got tough, when he was taken advantage of, when his own life seemed to be at stake, he went back to his experience at Bethel. This encounter with the living God, and it continued to carry him through all the trials and the tribulations that he's going to endure. His life isn't going to get easier. It's actually going to get harder. I ask of you one more time, do you have such an experience that you can go back to that will strengthen you in the tough times that will come your way? We're all going to face those tough times. I wonder how many of us have had that encounter with the living God. How many of us have had that Bethel experience? Maybe if you're like me, and I'll make it personal, maybe if you're like me, you don't spend a lot of time in reflection or thinking about those moments. Maybe it's just you're running around, you're in the rat race, and you're just trying to get by. You're busy, you've got a lot going on. But I want to challenge you today, and I want to ask you to do a little bit of homework. Because I believe this was so important for me, and I've done it several times. I need to do it again. It's been a couple years But here's what uh, a mentor long ago asked me to do. Almost, yeah, about 10 years ago or more. He asked me to write out my story. I know it's such an ancient practice to actually put pen to paper. But if you need to type it, you can type it. But write your story out. Write it out. When I did that, what I started to see was those Bethel moments in my life where, wow, God, you directed me, you saved me, you helped me get from here to here. And I would like to encourage you to write your story out. Now, I know there are many of you, and I'm looking at one couple, that they've, they've given me their written story. 
And praise the Lord, some people have intentionally done that. Some of you are historians and you love to write your history, so maybe you have it all. Well, I would encourage you this week, if you have that, review it. We as human beings are so forgetful. We need to be reminded of God's goodness. We need to be reminded of those moments when we had that encounter of God. We need to hold on to it because each one of us, I'm telling you today, you're all gonna go through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not an option. But the difference is is if we can hold on to those moments with God, God is going to continue to walk through this with us. And we don't need to lose sight of him. Remember, the enemy is trying to discourage and fill us with hopelessness. God is trying to restore us close to him and give us that calling that he has for us. There is a difference. And so I would just ask of you, this week, if you could take some time, I mean, for me, it took me a long time, but when I wrote it out, what I started to see, and it really got emotional for me because there were situations when I was writing my story out that I had not thought about for 20 years. It was very therapeutic. I hadn't thought about, but wow, how the Lord had protected me here. And I would ask of you, if you say to me right now, well, if I wrote it out, I'd probably see nothing come from it, okay? We'll still write it out. And if you see not God moving in your life anywhere in this story, then maybe that's something you gotta take before the living God and say, God, where are you? But write it out. Because we need these encounters and we need to be reminded of them. Why do you think Jacob puts a pillar there? He does it as a memory to remind him of when God, and he, and he remember, he has that, that memory now and he has that, mo- that pillar now. He's going back to that. When life's hard, when he's in this indentured servitude to his uncle, he needed to go back to those moments when God had mightily promised him something and given him assurance that he would go with him and would protect him, and yes, he would bless him. And he had to be reminded of that because his immediate circumstances did not look good. And we need that as well. And so I would encourage you, especially, I'm thinking of like people, the younger people, because I don't know, maybe the young adults do this. Maybe you journal, I don't know, I don't. But if you, I would encourage you young adults, write your story out, write it out even as young as you are, because I think what you'll discover is how God is moving in your life. And I want all ages to do it, but I find that many of our seniors in this church have written their story out. As they get near the end of their life, they start to write it out. But there's no better time than now to do it. It doesn't matter what age you are. Write the story out, and what you will start to see, I believe, is God mightily working in your life and how he is calling you to him. Amen. We are going to go into communion today, and I don't know if all the elements got passed out. Uh, If you don't have one of these uh, and you are saying you are a follower of Jesus, we would like to make sure we get this into your hands. So if you don't have one, please just raise your hand. We have someone here that is Uh, ready and able to get this to you. Uh, Jacob's story is a story of transformation and redemption. And God the Father continued this redemption story. And it goes, it comes all the way to when we meet Jesus Christ. We find that Jesus says, come to me, all those that are weak and weary. Come to me, for lasting peace. And so we today do this ceremony because we are looking for lasting fulfillment and we can find it in Jesus. We want to discover the change in our life and be an agent of change in our society. Well, we need the courage and the boldness that comes through being a follower of Jesus Christ. We want to experience freedom, freedom from the bondage of sin. We can find that through Jesus Christ. We want to be able to combat the schemes of the enemy that is constantly bombarding us within our society, telling us to just compromise. It's no big deal. Go ahead. What's one little mistake? What's one little, you know, it's just this little thing that you're off on. It's no big deal. It's right back to the garden again. Just just have a little bit of that fruit tree. It's no big deal. 
So that's why we're doing this today, is we're remembering the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, because it is through Jesus Christ that we have communion with the living God, that we are close to the living God, that we can call out to him, Abba, Father, and he listens and he speaks. Every time we do communion, I think of the Exodus story. You know, especially the, the element here of the, of the, of the juice, right? It's that, it's that blood that was poured out for us. It's like the angel of death coming to our doorstep, but we have the blood, the lamb's blood of Jesus Christ, and he passes over. He passes over our doorstep. Through Jesus Christ, we find eternal life. And so I want to read to you the early church, how they practiced communion. This is the instructions Paul gives to the church of Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, it says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. This right here is it's a wafer but it represents the body of Christ Jesus that was beaten and tortured on your behalf so that you could be close to him, so that you could have that encounter with the living God. Let us take of this bread. By the way, this might be a good time for some of you to just ask the living God f to forgive and heal you. There might be circumstances going on right now in your life and you need God to forgive you. There might be decisions you're making you know you're hurting yourself. This is the time to come before him. Come to the cross and ask him to heal you. It goes on as he's speaking to the church of Corinth. He says, in the same way he took the cup of wine, this is Jesus Christ, took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. As I said before, this drink represents the blood that was spilled out on your behalf so that you could be part of God's family. The angel of death has passed over you and you will live eternally with the, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let us take of this cup. Lord Jesus, I just would ask that you would help us to be, um, to live out what you see in our lives, the potential you see. I pray that you would help us to submit our lives to you, that you would continually bring us back to the cross, that we would continually be reminded of your great sacrifice, that God so loved the world that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And he didn't just send Jesus to be here on this earth, but he sent him to be sacrificed on our behalf. Lord Jesus, help us to live as you have called us to live. Help us to give our lives to you and find fulfillment. We ask this all in Jesus Christ's name, the name above every name. Amen. Worship team, could you please come on up? I just realized I didn't ask you to come up. I'm so sorry. Let us continue. Let's continue to worship and praise and give praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you. Yeah.
I just want to say a few words. Uh, I think it's really important that we um, talk about this. Jesus is not a theory, an abstract idea, some ideological construct. It's not even a religion. And I need you to hear this. It's a relationship, which is so different. He is the God who is with us. And you won't find that anywhere in any other ideology or any other God. This is the God of the universe that desires for you to have a relationship with him. And that is so different. I remember when I had my Bethel moment and God met me in a powerful way, I at that moment realized, wait a minute, this is real. And this is what has happened to Jacob. You know, when I was a young man, I was very angry, violent, 
And I went from being angry and violent to being peace, finding peace and joy. And I still had a lot to work on. I still have a lot to work on. But I can tell you when I encountered him, the game changed for me because I realized, wait a minute, this God is real and he desires to have a relationship with me. That was so different than my thought process of, some other, of any religion. This is not just about following certain codes. This is about having a relationship with the living God. It's about submitting your life to the living God. And as you do so, he will lead you and guide you. And he has a great calling for your life. And if you so choose to give your life to him, even today, he will begin to speak and call you. And so I would ask of you today, worship team, I mean, prayer team, could you please come on up? If you're here today and you are looking for a life, fulfillment, something that has meaning, you will find it in Jesus Christ. And if you're on the live stream today, my information is on the screen right now. You can contact me. Feel free. Bug me. I, would al I always want to talk Jesus with anyone and everyone. And if you don't want to talk to me, I'll find somebody. We got lots of people here that love Jesus and have a relationship with him. And I'll put you in contact with someone, I promise. So please feel free to contact me. I believe that the greatest decision I ever made in my life was when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. It was greater than anything else. That includes my marriage. That includes my children. Those were great moments. When I said yes to Jesus, the game changed for me. When I realized that this is a God that is real and wants to have a relationship with me and is not trying to beat me down or get me to do something, you know, manipulative for him. It was just simply, I desire for you to know me. And when I spent that time with God, God began to just change me. Because when I was close to him and I was reading his word, my thinking changed. My way of living changed. The way I saw life changed. My life began to change. And thus, I became an agent of change for my community. And that's what we want to see for each one of you. And so if today you're saying, yes, I want, I, I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to give my life to him. We are here. We're here to pray with you. If you're here and you just need prayer for anything in your life, I believe Jesus is the answer. We don't have the answers, but Jesus does. And so we would love to pray with you and seek the Lord with you. We are here, the prayer team. And so I want to just thank you again. It's always such a blessing to share God's word, and I'm so blessed to be here. For the rest of you, please know we are in the lower auditorium. We have cookies, dainties, treats, uh, coffee and tea. I hope you can join us, but please do. And by the way, we might need a few more people making dainties because the wonderful part about Fellowship Cafe is it's growing and we need more food. So if you say, I can bake, I can bring something, please go and talk to Margaret or Jean downstairs in the kitchen. Amen? Amen. Could we just stand for the benediction? Paul, speaking to a young Timothy, says, To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, to him be all glory forever and ever. And can God's people please say... Amen. Go in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen.